an officially called order this meeting of the Park City's Rotary Club, 31st meeting. Um, I want to welcome everybody and, and especially thank you for the, or appreciate having our guest today. So I'm going to ask you if you will at this time, go ahead and mute everyone, you know, if everyone will, well, Lori just muted everybody. And um, so um, again, I want to thank Lori. You're unmuted. Top of my top of my list was unmute self right up then, so I flew <laughs> right through that. So I did that twice. Um, but anyway, great to see you know um, Aaron as well as Matthew. If you take maybe a couple of minutes or a minute each, uh, repeat kind of what you said before about introduce yourself to the group because I think we have virtually everybody on now. Other people will be joining on, but not everybody heard your short introduction before. But if you would, Aaron, if you might. If you would unmute yourself and um, tell us who you are and how you ended up here. All right. Um, my name is Aaron Ngambi, and I was explaining that I'm from Zambia, which is a south central part of Africa. And I went from Zambia to Hawaii for school. Um, then I graduated from um, Hawaii in 2015 and moved to um, Ohio. And while I was in Hawaii, I helped establish the student club of Rotary on campus, which is Rotaract. And then when I got to Ohio, um, I joined the Rotary Club. I was actually an honorary member for the Rotary Club of Kent. Um, and my wife, she is uh, from Ohio, she is a nurse. And so she got a job in Texas and we just moved here. So good to be here. And welcome. Matthew? Would you do the same? I'm mutant. Uh, hi, I am Matthew Stollard. Um, I, so I graduated from Texas A&M um, in December. Uh, I have a degree in Parks and Rec, and I specialized with uh, certificates in youth development and Park and Rec administration. And I am uh, now working for the Boy Scouts of America, and I serve over the area of the Park Cities and uh, Fair Park. So thank you for having me. Fantastic, thank you. Again, Paul Pyrock specifically asked Matthew to join us today. I didn't get the detail for everybody, but the reason I'm trying to uh, muddle through this is the fact that Barb Jeffries, our president, uh, is in Augusta, Georgia, celebrating the birthday, the fourth birthday of one of her granddaughters. So um, like I said, the responsibility has slid down on me, but it's my honor to to try to orchestrate this meeting today. So um, before we officially begin the program as such with the various people giving the invocation, et cetera, are there any share, do we wanna, uh, any joys or concerns specifically that we ought to share with the group that you feel like adding? And if you, if you do, um, please unmute yourself to add those. Okay, well, uh, hearing none, I'll just going, let's go through the order of the people that will go through the various steps here. Oh, uh, yes, as Laurie just said, birthdays first. We want to, we want to celebrate the people that have had, that are having March birthdays. And um, specifically this week is, uh, I think, Lisa Amsbury and Cindy Cummings, John Glancy are this week as well as Scott Sauer. So um, happy birthday, first of all. Congratulations for a birthday. Uh, this also gives us the opportunity to uh, remind you and encourage you to make, it's a good reminder about making a contribution to the foundations that we support. Um, both the Rotary Club of Park Cities Foundation, our own personal foundation, which is now around a million four accumulation or so, and that is dedicated for local initiatives that we support. And then of course, Rotary International is the, the master foundation of Rotary and um, two separate foundations. It's much more, Rotary RI Foundation is much more focused on international and global grants. So two separate foundations, but again, reminder of, um, we appreciate your support. And uh, when your birthday rolls around, it's a good reminder to do that. 
All right, now I would like in sequence, like to call on Patsy Watson, who's gonna give the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Then we'll have the uh, national anthem video that Ian Mudge in four part harmony somehow uh, created. Um, and then Mary McMahon will highlight our marketplace advertiser. Happy Franklin um, is gonna talk about a fellowship event that's tomorrow. And then Holly Hollenbeck is gonna talk about our PCR Connect, which is next Wednesday, I believe. So if Patsy, if you would take the floor, I would appreciate it. All right, please bow your heads. Dear Lord, please be with any fellow Rotarians who are currently going through difficult times or have any health situations. Be with families continuing to suffer from COVID or other illnesses or family tragedies. Thank you that so many people have been able to be vaccinated and the good news that most can be vaccinated by sometime in the summer. We have so many blessings and are grateful for all you do. Thank you, Amen. Now I say the pledge. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lovers wake and you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last weaving whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous light for the ramparts we watched were so Okay, Mary, if you'll unmute. Mary, if you'll unmute yourself. Thank Unmuted, you thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, my fellow Rotarians. Um, please join me in honoring um, Richard Stanford and Highland Park United Methodist Church as this week's PCR Marketplace Advertiser. Highland Park United Methodist Church is one of the three largest churches in its denomination with a membership of 17,000 and is located on the SMU campus at Mockingbird and Bishop. Highland Park United Methodist Church has satellite congregations at Munger Place Church in East Dallas and the Grove in North Dallas. It is soon beginning a new worshiping congregation at the House of Blues in the Dallas downtown area. Together with strong programs for youth, children, and families, the church offers an array of programs to enrich and disciple people of all ages. Highland Park United Methodist Church also provides the Wesley House, a community for college students on the SMU campus. A unique feature of its main campus are the multiple forms of worship offered every Sunday. And by the way, services will be reopening um, this fall with appropriate precautions. But um, worship offered is high church, contemporary, traditional, a teaching service, and youth worship at the Tolleson Family Activity Center. Its outreach supports dozens of nonprofits and projects benefiting the community. It has become the world's largest habitat provider and operates both an orphanage in Costa Rica and an eye clinic in Haiti. During the summer of the COVID pandemic, Highland Park United Methodist Church provided over 2,000 meals 
per day to people in need. Highland Park United Methodist Church is the place to find community and to grow in faith and service. Thank you, Past President Richard and Highland Park United Methodist Church for being a PCR Marketplace advertiser. We appreciate you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mary. Happy, are you on the line? All right, so much for our live spot. Um, let me really, I'll just quickly fill in that, um, that there is a fellowship event tomorrow, the meditative hike. And I believe uh, that Happy sent out another email reminder about that this morning. So I'm not, quite frankly, I'm not, being, I'm not able to attend, but so I didn't pay too much attention to the time today. But look in your email uh, this morning from Happy. Uh, I believe the cost is $10. There's a, there's a guide that's going to, I'm not sure exactly how they're gonna pull this off, but something that the hike is through Revachon Park, supposed to be an hour and a half or so. And um, somehow you're gonna meditate and probably do some yoga and et cetera. So um, look for the details. I think, Jody, I think you might have signed up for it if I recall correctly. Is there any more details that, that I left out? I don't have anything extra. Okay, super. All right, so check your email on that. So with that, let me, uh, Holly, is going to tell us about Peace or Connect uh, next week. Hello, hello everyone, and uh, uh, happy to be here with all my fellow people of action. Um, I am here to uh, remind us all that uh, PCR Connect, our networking opportunity, is next Thursday from 5 to 7, and this one will be entirely on Zoom. Next month, we'll do a hybrid, but next Thursday, the 18th, 5 to 7 on Zoom, we're going to have some fun um, ice-breaking activities, talk about how we can help each other and network in our business world, and uh, just generally socialize with our fellow uh uh, Park City Rotarians. So please join us. It's a fun opportunity. Love to see some new faces. And uh, any guests here today, we'd love to have you join us as well. So uh, next Thursday, five to seven, um, Zoom. Uh, look for your email and the announcements will be in the newsletter as well to uh, get that Zoom link. Thanks. Fantastic. Really appreciate it. So those were always fun. And, and especially one more month, we're going to be doing the Zoom and hopefully. Um, a different format uh, beginning in April. So uh, in like manner, our, our uh, meetings, let me change that. Um, yes, for the next, uh, next, next two weeks, for the remainder of March, we'll continue to be uh, having these meetings via Zoom. Starting at 1140, we're, we're starting the fellowship time, but the official meeting starts at noon. And um, you see there on the screen, the two speakers, Dan Henry, Fox 4 meteorologist, is going to be able to return. He, he was, uh, I was not able to join us a few weeks ago. Maybe he had something to do with that uh, snow blizzard that we had. And then also the next week on the 26th, Lori Kreider with the American Foundation to Suicide will be with us talking about the mental health challenges that the COVID lockdown, I'm sure, has aggravated. So, um, uh, you know, the link to the Zoom meetings, look for those links. Um, Betty Dawson adds those when she sends out the weekly hub, which are newsletter uh, each Thursday. And also that link is on the club's website. Um, be looking out for that on the homepage. So uh, with no further ado, oh, I will add, yes, two things. Thank you, Lori. Um, April 2nd is Good Friday. So there's no meeting that day and then uh, based on uh, popular uh, results from our survey, we, we fully intend to start meeting at Magianos again on the 9th. Uh, we've worked out the details. There's going to be, the seating is going to be six per table. And obviously, if you're not comfortable resuming meeting in person, um, Mark Neese will still be doing his live stream broadcast, and you can join in that way. But we're looking forward to, again, meeting in person um, April 9th. We'll send out details of who that speaker is and that sort of thing. But we had a great response. I think over three quarters of the total membership responded to Barb's survey. And I'd say it was a landslide vote to continue. 
something like 65% or so were comfortable to begin in April. And a number of people that said no, generally it was not, not yet. But um, we're gonna, uh, we've made the arrangements. The, the price will be the same. Uh, it will be a, a seated, plated, or plated, I guess would be appropriate terminology. Uh, they are not buffet, but plated. And um, my generals is really looking forward to, forward to us returning. So with uh, no further ado, let me turn the program over to Richard Stanford, who is going to introduce today's program. Yes, uh, and it is a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, a, a program that's pre-recorded, although he's on this call. Uh, but uh, Charles Colley, CC, uh, graduate of the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, um, longtime Dallas businessman and investor. Um, for, for we who are Rotarians, uh, he made a significant contribution uh, uh, when he served not only as district governor, but when Bill's dad, Dwight Sleeper, passed away, the president, uh, the district governor elect, uh, CC did a second term. So he had he has he has served twice as district governor of this district. Um, now uh, he fought in the Pacific War. Three hundred thousand people of the sixteen million who put on a uniform or directly supported the war effort uh, uh, are still alive, just 300,000. Of that 300,000, a lot were stateside, a lot were in Europe. Uh, many because of age uh, are no longer able to really coherently tell their stories. Uh, but CC is one of that, those few who can tell the story. CC is an avid reader uh, and, and just, uh, and, and really, uh, a fine speaker, you're about to find out, but he's telling a story that very few people can tell anymore. He's telling his story of the war in the Pacific as a young uh, lieutenant aboard the destroyer Blue. Now, he has given uh, another testimony to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. Uh, I like this one better because the World War II Museum, uh, CC let me listen to that, uh, they're so taken with what day was it? And they're, they're trying to document the war through its remaining veterans. Uh, but this one you'll find gets the real personal experience of C.C. Colley as a young lieutenant aboard the Blue. Uh, that ship got seven battle stars. Uh, and you'll hear more about that. But it got seven battle stars. And so, uh, uh, We'll start it, but I do want to say this can, if you like what you hear on this and want to share it with relatives and friends, uh, we've archived it. I, I do a, a kind of a YouTube channel. It's, it's, uh, Mark set it up. It's, ca it's called the Stanford Digest on YouTube. You can look it up. You can play this directly off of, uh, off of uh, that YouTube uh, site. And I recently found out I have a, uh, a TV and I'm always looking at Netflix and this, that, and the other. And there's one thing there, it says apps. So I clicked on apps and it allowed me to go to YouTube. I did Stanford Digest, picked out CC. And I got to watch CC on the big screen in my living room. So that's possible too, by putting this on YouTube. So I just want to let you know if, if you like this and want to share it with others. So uh, so go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and play uh, CC Collie. Well, CC, you lived uh, a life of almost 18 years before World War II. Uh, tell me a little bit about your upbringing and your life before the war. Well, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas in uh, 1922 and uh, graduated from Central High School there, the infamous Billy, after I, that was after I left. But I graduated from high school in uh, 19, in May of 1940, and by then, World War One was uh, World War II was already going on. It started September 1st, 1939, as you know. So in 40, when I went away to college, I knew to 
I enrolled in the Wharton School in September of 1940, and the same day I enrolled, enlisted in the Naval ROTC. So I put on the uniform in 1940, and uh, I got out in 1946, so I had six years there. And uh, I was scheduled to graduate in 1944, but with the war going on, they accelerated our program. So in 1943, about May, I think, I received in the same day, I received my uh, diploma uh, graduation from uh, the Wharton School. I received uh, my commission in the Navy, and I received assignment to my ship, Destroyer Blue 744. Well, and that begs the question, how do you go from the hallowed halls of Wharton to the South Pacific on the blue? How did that happen? Well, it, uh, the Naval Bureau personnel made it all happen because when I was in Naval ROTC, interesting point, near the, uh, the last year I was in the, in the ROTC, uh, they started, our instructors are Naval officers. And they started reassigning these instructors of ours to ships, so they didn't replace them. My senior year, I was picked to instruct the freshman class in Naval ROTC in uh, communication and navigation. So with those two particular backgrounds in my naval training, uh, the Bureau of Personnel assigned me as communication officer on this new destroyer. We put it in commission in uh, 1944, and uh, it was the latest and biggest uh, uh, destroyer, 2,200 tons. We had three turrets of five-inch guns, two in each mount, two, three turrets, so we had six five-inch guns. We had 10 torpedoes. We had a bunch of depth charges. We had 20 millimeter anti-aircraft, 40 millimeter anti-aircraft, and we were fast and we were the largest and the newest ships in the fleet, so we were assigned to, within the Pacific to the fast carrier task forces. Okay, now you had to get all the way from, what, Pennsylvania, is that, Wharton is Pennsylvania? Philadelphia, All right. the way from Philadelphia to somewhere in the Pacific. Where was the blue and how did you get there? The blue was, uh, uh, I went on board the ship while it's still being, in, in, in built when it was under construction in the Staten Island Navy Yard. And then we that ship, our ship was towed from there to the Brooklyn Navy Yard where it was fitted out. And I was on it all that time. And from there, Brooklyn, we went to a 30-day shakedown cruise, it's called, around Bermuda. We went back to, Brook, uh, to Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for things that needed done. Well, that, that's what a shakedown cruise does. It tells you what equipment is needed to be changed or improved or s changed out, whatever. So we left Brooklyn Navy Yard and headed after our shakedown cruise down the East Coast through the Panama Canal and to Pearl Harbor. And uh, from there we joined the fleet. Where was the fleet at that time? Uh, it was... Uh, just north of the equator around Kwajalein and uh, I and before after I graduated while the ship was being constructed during those four or five months I went to four different radar schools so I was the radar officer on my ship I was a communication officer and I had I was in charge of combat information center CIC and I was a fighter direction officer with all that those schools we sent me to. I learned all that. And uh, during the war, I would direct fighter direct, uh, direct the fighters uh, to intercept. we pick up on radar the Japs coming in, and I would direct our fighter cover to intercept them. That was my job. Okay. Now, in the course of all of that, after you met the fleet, you spent a lot of time at sea. <laughs> we, we know that. From then on, yeah. yeah. But what, now, let what, me, let yeah, me stop a second. Yeah. I want to tell a, an interesting story that's not about me, but it, to me it's one of the most 
fascinating stories. We, I said we went to Pearl Harbor. Of course, I wasn't there in December 741, but <laughs> outside of the submarine nets to get into Pearl Harbor, there was a, an old four-stack World War I destroyer and doing patrol out there, to, patrolling for submarines trying to get into Pearl Harbor through the nets. They would follow tugs in or ships going in. These submarines would follow them to be able to get through the submarine nets. Well, this old destroyer was named the Ward, and the captain of the Ward had been on board two days when on, he came on board December 6th. And December 7th, he had his, he was a young lieutenant. His name was William Allerbridge. And uh, a tugboat radioed to the ward saying they thought the submarine trying to follow them in. So the ward went over there and saw the submarine. They fired one shot right through the conning tower and sunk that submarine. But they never could verify that because there was no evidence the submarine sank. But about 10 or 12 years ago, this high technology we have now for underwater sur uh, surveillance or photography, they took a picture of this. It was a, it was a Japanese midget submarine. And in this photograph, published in the newspapers all over, there was this three or I don't know if they had a three or four inch deck gun. They only had one gun, it's manually fired, and they got right in the middle of that conning tower. So the war fired the first shot in the Pacific in World War II. Fast forward three years to the day, December 7, 1944, we're operating off of the Philippines. And the uh, in October of 44 is when they Japanese first picked up the idea and the effort of kamikazes, just flying their airplanes into our ships. Well, the war was operating with the landing forces. We were with the fast carrier task forces. But the, so the old board was with these, giving support to the landing troops. A kamikaze hit the ward and practically sunk her. The, the captain ordered abandon ship but the war didn't sink. So a new destroyer that joined the outfit was named O'Brien. The O'Brien was ordered to sink the ward. The captain of the O'Brien was William Outerbridge. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Isn't that a fascinating story? I've never heard that. That's amazing. He, he sunk his own whole, the, his first ship, he, he sunk it. <laughs> okay, I'm, I diversed. We're, 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 where were we? Uh, we're just going to talk in general about the campaigns that, that that you and the Blue were on in the Pacific. I know you had battle stars and, and uh, seven battle stars, and those battles were well the Philippines, of course, the start and uh, Peleliu, uh, Saipan, Guam, Tinian, Iwo Jima, and the seventh was Okinawa. That was our long, longest and toughest campaign. The second longest naval campaign in the Pacific, the first was Guadalcanal, and uh, operating around those waters with uh, several battles. Yeah. But uh, we weren't there at that time. We were in, uh, as I said, near the, the last battle was Okinawa. And uh, we, the troops landed April 1st, April Fool's Day, which also happened to be Easter Sunday. And uh, there were more ships and airplanes off of Okinawa than there were anywhere else except in Normandy. And we had, but the kamikazes, the, from April 1st to June 22nd, that was an 82-day campaign. The Japanese flew 3,700 sorties against our fleet. Of those 3,700 sorties, 1,600 of them were kamikaze. They sunk over a hundred of, of our ships at Okinawa. Um, we lost over 10,000 naval personnel on those ships. And uh, of those ships, 10 were destroyers. There were more destroyers lost in World War II in all Europe and Pacific 
than any other type ship. We lost uh, 73 destroyers. The second most was submarines, and we lost 52 submarines. Wow. And, and now, let, let's talk about kamikaze. That's a fascinating uh, piece of the war that you experienced firsthand. Now, I know that there were, uh, you, you rotated uh, the, a ring kind of system around the we fleet. Call, they called it radar picket okay. duty okay. ships. And uh, it made a circle around Okinawa because Jap com uh, kamikazes came from everywhere, uh, Kyushu Island, just two or three hundred miles off from Okinawa. And in the circle of destroyers were numbered one at the north, closest to Japan, around 15. And out of this 82 campaign, our ship was assigned radar picket duty 22 times. And out of those 22 times, nine times, we were in radar picket station number one, which is closer to Japan and the first ship that the kamikaze saw when they were coming to the fleet. And a lot of these pilots of the Japs were inexperienced, young, just <laughs> just had been, been trained as pilots. And uh, they see a destroyer, they think it's a battleship. So they attacked station number one more than any other and uh six one of the times we were on station one was uh april the 22nd but because the 16th six days earlier the laffey had been on number one and she was attacked by 22 kamikazes 12 of them hit her and six of the bombs hit her and she still was afloat and it same class destroyer as the blue, my ship. It's the only, the, the Laffey is the only destroyer of our class still afloat, and it's uh, berthed over at uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Sue's been over there to see that ship and go on board. It's a great experience. Did, did, did the blue ever get targeted by a kamikaze? Yes, uh, by one. <laughs> out of all the times we were on the radar picket, these destroyers were sent out by them uh, with two destroyers at a time, uh, about 60 miles from the fleet, between the fleet and Japan, to give early warning. And also, the carriers would send a, call it CAP, Combat Air Patrol, would circle us. And when I would see a Japs coming in, I would radio our pilot, our uh, cap, and they would go intercept the kamikazes. Uh, but we, our cap was four fighters, and uh, the Japs would fly in these kamikazes a hundred at a time. So many of them passed us and went on the fleet, but many of them tried for the picket destroyers. Okay. Fascinating. <laughs> we never <laughs> did hit, and, and we, but there, so many on, on picket duty did. And as I said, we, we had one, we got a photograph of this bomb splash, oh, about 20, 30 yards off the ship. We shot their plane down, and then beyond that is the plane crashing into the water. It's a great photograph, and I still have it. The doctor on our ship, every ship in the Navy was issued a camera, a good camera. And our doctor didn't have anything to do, but when we were at battle stations, so uh, he was the he took pictures. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and this is one of them. Great picture. Oh, by the way, when we jumped up to the end of the campaign, uh, the last one being Okin Okinawa. Let's go back to uh, 1944 uh, when we joined the, the carriers, the fleet, and. Uh, in December 18th of that year, we were in the first of three typhoons. And in that typhoon, the first one, we lost three destroyers. And so that's over a thousand men uh, losing their ships. And uh, out of those that went into the water, mo I guess most of them went down with the ship, but there were 92 that we were able to pick up. Uh, our destroyer and two others were assigned the job of searching for these people. But the uh, the waves were recorded uh, at over uh, 
a hundred feet, and uh, and the uh, wind velocity was recorded at uh, uh, no, I have it backwards. The wind velocity was over a hundred miles per hour, and the wave height was eighty feet. And that was the typhoon. That's what a typhoon is. And we, as I said, we lost three of our destroyers. Uh, but w then we had a typhoon in in uh, Jan in January, <coughs> January the tenth, when we were in the South China Sea. And uh, then in June, June the fifth, we had our third typhoon. <laughs> and in that one, the hundred feet length of the bow of the Pittsburgh broke off because these w water is so powerful coming down and the ship you'd go up and waves would come down this bow br broke off and it floated and uh, my ship was assigned the job to take the bow of the Pittsburgh in tow and the Pittsburgh was she had watertight security you know they were still, they flo they're still afloat. The bow was still afloat. So in her own power, uh, the Pittsburgh went back to Guam at four knots. <laughs> and uh, we towed the bow at four knots for two days. Then a ship, uh, a fleet tug came out and relieved us towing. But we still went at four knots. But we were able then to go to six knots. We were damaged in the typhoon. We were also going to Guam for repairs, but uh, that was an interesting thing. We call that the Pit suburb of Pittsburgh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that was an interesting thing that happened. Well, after doing Peleliu and 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 Saipan and Tinian and Iwo, Iwo. yeah, Iwo. And Iwo, Iwo was bad, and, and Iwo, all the all the great battles of the Second World War in the Pacific, and Okinawa. Uh, the blue ended up in Tokyo Bay, but the war wasn't over. <laughs> yeah, well, that, the way we wound up in Tokyo Bay and uh, the, well, I'll go back. No, that we'll go there first. In July the twenty second, the 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 surrender was August fifteenth. Remember, so July the twenty second. My squadron of destroyers, nine destroyers, was were detached from the carriers, from the carrier task force, from the fleet, to make a midnight run into Tokyo Bay. Nine destroyers, single file, full speed, and we ran in there and just for targets of opportunity, but also to see what sort of defenses we ha they had, and uh, so if uh, they sunk all of us within the the uh, war planners didn't know what they had a tough job ahead but we did we it was such a surprise to the japs we went in there and uh, we were credited with sinking uh, uh two or three uh cargo ships and a couple of our uh, other auxiliary ships and we went in there for at full speed for about 30 minutes and then we did a 180 and got out of there and we never got hit so uh, that was uh, about three weeks before the war was over. But uh, so uh, we, we were rejoined the fleet, the carriers. And we were, uh, since March, the B-29s and the carrier planes had been bombarding the, the mainland of Japan, Tokyo, all the industrial centers since March. So finally, in April the 5th, August the 15th, the Japs surrendered. That was at 8.30 on a morning, August 15th. At 2 o'clock uh, that afternoon, here came some kamikazes. And uh, the war had been over since 8.30 in the morning, and everybody's happy, fat, dumb, and happy. And so these ships started radioing a message to the uh, admiral running in charge of the fleet said what do we do with these kamikazes coming in the war's over and the admiral sent message back he said shoot them if you're attacked by hostile he didn't say japs or enemy if you're attacked by hostile aircraft shoot them down in a friendly manner <laughs> which we did so there were six in that uh, group and we shot uh, 
No, I th our fighter plane shot them all down. Yes. Wow. And, and so there you were, uh, basically around the Japanese home islands. Three weeks later, um, after you had been in Tokyo Bay, but yeah. but uh, or three weeks after the, the 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 surrender, they had the formal surrender. Yeah. And you were there. And I, and I, before talk about we that get something. that, okay. that was September second. But the four, they surrendered August the 15th, something that's not known by anyone. On the August the 18th, MacArthur ordered the Japanese to send representatives in two Japanese bombers that Mar MacArthur had painted white with green crosses, uh, like Red Cross, but that type of cross. But these were green on a white two-engine Japanese bomber, and they flew the f two of those down to uh, uh, Ishima, which is a little island off of Okinawa, which was a, mili uh, a military, uh, Army and Navy used that base just well, 10 miles off of Okinawa. These two Jap planes landed there, and uh, then they were put, a put aboard a MacArthur's airplane, <laughs> His name he put on his airplane was a four-engine American bomber called the Baton. So here these Japs were getting on. He made a point of that. Well, they flew them down to Manila for, to get all their instructions, what they were to do. One interesting thing MacArthur required them to do when they came back to, went back to Japan was take all the propellers. There were no jets then. All the propellers off of all the airplanes parked around the country, everywhere. And uh, so that some fanatic couldn't take off and try to do some kamikaze action. So um, interesting thing, MacArthur never met these in, uh, envoys or ambassadors from Japan. They came down to get their instructions on what was to be done. And when, when we were going in with land troops and flying in troops, they went over all that, but MacArthur did not meet them. Interesting thing, uh, his chief of staff was a, a, a Marine general named Donald Sutherland. Uh, now we go up to the surrender September 2nd. Uh, we were anchored about a thousand yards off the starboard quarter of uh, the uh, Missouri. So with binoculars, I could see the ceremony and uh, they broadcast all the proceedings to the fleet. So I heard it and w watched it. So I saw that, uh, and I go back to General Sutherland, on the, that was the second. On the 4th of September, we received orders to go alongside the Missouri to pick up Jim MacArthur as chief of staff and take him over to Yokohama Japanese Naval Base, which we, we are occupying everything but then, of course. But I don't know, he had some job to do over there, so we went over, picked him, went over to the Missouri, picked up the general, and took him over there. Uh, the uh, surrender ceremony, interestingly, only lasted two minutes. MacArthur spoke that, the only one that spoke was MacArthur for two minutes. And no, no other American or uh, British, anybody spoke. Uh, MacArthur then signed the surrender and uh, gave the pins to some uh, couple of his generals. Skinny Wainwright was one of them, I remember. And then seven other Allied representatives signed, a British and Australian and, and Russian. And uh, so then... There were, as I said, no Japanese signed it. There were 11 of them in that Japanese contingent. And they stood in two rows opposite the desk where MacArthur was seated. The most uh, memorable and impressive thing that happened that day, when the cer ceremony was over, 1,600 airplanes did a flyover over Tokyo Bay the first 600 are B-29s. They flew over at 3,000 feet. The next 
thousand airplanes were Army and Navy and Marine fighters, bombers, uh, torpedo, everything. One thousand of those at fifteen hundred feet. So here was this black cloud of airplanes and all the noise of that many airplanes at fifty at, at that low level, and that was very impressive and very memorable. That that for anybody who's not uh, knowledgeable about that is what we call VJ Day, Victory Over Japan. Yeah, that was a yeah. big day in the history of World War II, and you were there. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people, the war in Europe was already over. They were coming home, and, and even the people in the Pacific were coming uh, back in the fall. You didn't get back in the fall. Uh, tell, tell us about what happened after VJ well, Day. Well, it was nothing memorable. It's just yeah. the fact that I was on the ship. The ship came back to the States, to Bremerton, Washington, for major overall. They gave us 30 days leave, went back to the ship, and, uh, and then we did some training exercises off of California. Then we went to Pearl Harbor, and uh, by then it was uh, May of 46, and uh, the ship after Pearl Harbor was assigned to China Station. So the day my ship, I was discharged from the ship at Pearl Harbor, and my ship left for China. <laughs> so I, I was able to get off in time before <laughs> they left. And uh, so I stayed two or three weeks in the bachelor officer quarter in, in uh, Pearl Harbor waiting for transportation back to the States. So finally I was discharged in May of 46. But you were still in the reserves, weren't you? Yeah, I stayed in the reserves. <laughs> I, I stayed in the reserves until... Uh, 1945, five years later, the U.S. went to war in Korea, and I was called back into active duty. And ironically, I was on a small ship, a destroyer in the Pacific. My assignment for the Korean War was the battleship Missouri in the, in the Atlantic, so I thought that was naval uh, a logic, a lot of something, planning, you know, big ship, uh, Atlantic, small ship, Pacific. Uh, but anyway, I went, I had to go to Washington to beg out of that because, but then I, I had a family and I, I had my own business and they let me out, said, but you got to get out of the reserve. So I said, I'll do that. <laughs> well, uh, the obvious question, having been through the war with you, um, uh, you were, you were at all, all the great all the great conflicts of the Pacific, uh, other than perhaps Guadalcanal. And the, yeah, in the, the early point. stages, yeah. like Cor Battle of Coral right, Sea right, and, and uh, Cape Esperance, right. those were around Guadalcanal right. in 42. Right. But then after that, you, you were part hit, of it, hit and, most of them. Yeah, and, and uh, so I, I guess my final question would be, um, musing on that, uh, uh, your thoughts about your part in the war, your part, thoughts about the war uh, and what it meant. Well, of course, it, we were effective. The, the the naval fleet in in the air operations that won uh, that won the war out there. Uh, but uh, my job was uh, it was interesting. Uh, not only did I have this battle uh, station assignment in CIC with the radars and uh, all the men I had working for me there. I had to stand watch. I was a qualified deck officer, and uh, I had control or con of the ship for four hour, four hours on and four hours off. So there's not much time for rest because during the four hours off, the Japs would come in with kamikazes, or if it's night, what we call bed check, bed check Charlie would fly around, and we didn't know when, when he's ever going to come in, so he just fly around, so we'd have to stay at battle stations. So the one th word, one thing I remember most about being at war in the Navy, ground troops, something entirely different, as you, of course, was fatigue. Just never could get enough rest or sleep. Fatigue. That was the overpowering thing. Okay. Years on the water, <laughs> fatigue. Yeah, you know, people don't understand what life on, on a ship like the Blue was for years. We talk about the campaigns, but the daily life, yeah. 
is what well, you're Well, you're, you're, you're fighting to get a chance to rest, at get in your bunk. Uh, I, as a junior officer, I was, we, we had, an officer's headquarters, we had a, a compartment for three officers, three bunks, and I had the top bunk, and it was right next to the steel deck outside, so the Pacific Sun made that like a heating element there, and I had that top bunk, so I had an electrician may put a fan on the stanchion that held the bunk up. That fan blew on me all the times, only thing kept me alive. But I could not sit up in that bunk. I had to climb up over the first two and roll in, and then roll out to get out of it. But uh, we, there were three officers' compartments back in this little passageway. So the, the, there were three, and then the executive officer, executive officer was by himself. So the seven of us, and we had one shower and lavatory and toilet for, the, for us. So we had a pretty good deal. But you also worked probably in a, in a sort of a dark area working CIC because you were looking at Well, radar. that was at Battle Station. I was yeah. talking about where I was yeah. bunking. Yeah. Where, but, yeah, up forward when I go to Battle Stations, we were just down below the bridge. And we had a big compartment. No no uh, portholes. No, uh, it was dark in there all the time. Yeah. Right, right. Because of these radar scopes, we had to keep it dark. Any final word, the war, your experience, what it meant, anything would you want to say? Well, uh, I think I pretty much said it all. Okay. I, uh, I, I, I was honored to serve our country, and it's, it's a visceral part of my life, of course, the, the experience. And you should be proud. Yeah. Thank you, C.C. Colley. Uh, this has been a wonderful session. Good. Thank you very much. Good. That's fantastic. Richard? Yes. Um, I, I want to say I, several people have joined while this was going on. Uh, some of them, like Griff, already know about it, the uh, Griffin uh, colleague. But uh, I saw LB Showalter came on. Uh, and so certain people don't know um, or maybe didn't hear how you get to this. You can either get to it online under YouTube. We just we put it under some stuff I do called Stanford Digest. You can you can you can click on CC's deal and hear it off of that. And I and I had also said uh, previously, uh, if I, I just found out if if you have a TV that has an apps thing on it, uh, I went to apps and then went to Stanford Digest and went to uh, went to YouTube and then Stanford Digest. I saw CC in my living room on the big screen. So uh, that's all available if you want to share that with your family. Uh, now, I don't know. We're going to try something here. CC's been on this call, uh, but may there there uh, doesn't have video. Uh, there may be an audio problem. Let me ask CC, can you hear this and can you reply? Are you asking CC or Griffin? Uh, CC. CC's on his computer. Uh, oh. And he, he's getting the audio, but uh, I don't know that he'll be able to reply. Um, but, uh, it, it, we couldn't find mute on his machine. Uh, hit audio CC and see if you can do anything. And if you can't, Griff may want to reply. Uh, uh, okay. Well, CC, uh, we, we'll hopefully be seeing CC pretty soon in person uh, one of these days. So, so uh you can ask him your questions then. But uh, we did get some questions besides, and I don't know if CC was watching the, the chat stuff, but people are so impressed by what they just heard and, and you wouldn't believe the kind of chat stuff we were getting. But, but, um, but anyway, any questions in there and maybe Griff can answer the questions. So anybody wanna unmute any questions, anything on chat? Richard, let me relay one that Jeff Brady asked. Um, I'm not sure exactly who can address this or not, but he said that he had heard that at least some of the Japanese officers who were at the signing ceremony on the USS Missouri wore their best and most formal uniforms because they assumed they would be put to death after the ceremonies. 
Oh, no, that's true. Uh, yeah, I can answer that one. That is, that is, they had no idea what was going to happen to them. And, and in fact, when MacArthur uh, went into Tokyo, uh, you know, brave on his part because he went in without a weapon on him all the japanese soldiers lining from the airport that had recently had zeros flying off of it uh, all the way into town with their backs turned away but all the way into tokyo uh, if they had turned on him who knows but when he met with first with hirohito hirohito had no idea what was going to happen to him either so no that's true hmm. well i'll also add that kathy wall's dad served on the USS Missouri. And I really? assume, okay. assume that he was there at the ceremony as well, which that's quite a coincidence. And I'll <laughs> yeah. to relay just how meaningful this program has been to her personally. And to all of us, quite frankly, this is, this is an incredible relay. The detail that CC was able to relay in your interview <clears throat> is, is unbelievable. I, I don't yeah. remember what I had for lunch yesterday. <laughs> and he's talking about all these details and I can imagine the Agreed. especially the flyover during the ceremony was um, ear shattering uh, if nothing else super impressive with our with our stream Sean Johnson added that, that his twin boys are at the Naval Academy now mm. as well so that he has that connection well, it, it, if there are no other questions, uh, all we can say again, because CC can hear this, is thank you, CC. I mean, you have a, a very unique story, uh, unlike any other, and it's just a privilege to, to know you. Well, in the pictures, you see lots of people clapping. Um, and um, Lee Wagner added that if we were there in person, that uh, we would be all giving you a standing ovation, a very long standing ovation, mm -hmm. CC. So thank you for sharing this and for being um, a member of our club and so important to us as Rotarian and to your country. So um, also I will say, by the way, that the, uh, you know, we do record every meeting. And so on our YouTube channel, you can see this reproduction as well, in addition to Richard's Stanford Digest. So, Cece, you know our custom, and you may at this point already have a, a wing of these books, or at least a section within the library at the Preston Hollow Elementary, but we'll be presenting a book in your honor uh, to that school for being with us today uh, with this video. So with, with that, um, remember, remember next week, um, our speaker will be Dan Henry, Fox 4 meteorologist, and we look forward to that again by Zoom meeting for two more weeks before we, before Good Friday, and then we'll resume in-person meetings April 9th. So if you will join me, I will close the meeting with the four-way test. And here we go. So um, other things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Better friendships. And fourth, fourth will, it be, will it be beneficial to all concerned? All concerned. I will adjourn the meeting. And thank you for attending. Thank you again. Have a great weekend, everybody. You too. Yes, thank you. Have a great weekend.